Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Living with ADHD and CPTSD, this time YouTube podcast. Today, I am going to discuss more on autism and specifically high functioning autistic people like myself and some of the things that occur during autistic episodes and symptoms and signs that someone is autistic. Today is a day where the realization or the reality and the fact that autism, autism is something in my life that affects me very much. So I felt that it was important to discuss this on a scale that is very beneficial and hopefully educational for those who aren't familiar or aren't as familiar with autism as some people and things to notice or realize when it comes to autism. So let's go through it and hopefully we can learn something together. Okay, so high functioning autism isn't an official medical term or diagnosis. It is an informal one some people use when they talk about people with an autism spectrum disorder who can speak, read, write, and handle basic life skills like eating and getting dressed. They can live independently. For a long time, however, only people with very severe symptoms were ever diagnosed with autism. Starting in the 1990s, milder forms were recognized, including high-functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome, which share many of the same symptoms. Then in 2013, the American Psychiatric Association grouped the autism-related disorders into one term, Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD. Still, you may hear some people who aren't doctors continue to use their terms like Asperger's. It may be that they're not familiar with the spectrum, or they may be referring to a diagnosis made before the conditions were renamed as Autism Spectrum Disorder. Symptoms. Like all people with on the autism spectrum, people who are high functioning have a hard time with social interaction and communication. They don't naturally read social cues and might find it difficult to make friends. They can get so stressed by a social situation that they shut down. They don't make much eye contact or small talk. People on the spectrum who are high functioning can also be very devoted to their routine and order. They might have repetitive and restrictive habits that seem odd to others. There is a wide range of how they do work, do with school and work. Some do very well in school while others get overwhelmed and can't concentrate. Some hold a job and others find that really hard to do. It all depends on the person and the situation, but even for someone on the spectrum who can do a lot, the commonality among those diagnosed with ASD is under, underdeveloped social skills. So Asperger's syndrome, which is now in the autism spectrum disorder, is the following. When you meet someone who has Asperger's syndrome, you might notice two things right off. They're just as smart as other folks, but they have more trouble with social skills. They also tend to have an obsessive focus on one topic or perform the same behaviors again and again. Doctors used to think of Asperger's as a separate condition, but in 2013, the newest edition of the standard book that mental health experts use called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5, changed how it's classified. Today, Asperger's syndrome is te technically no longer a diagnosis on its own. It is now part of a broader category called Autism Spectrum Disorder. This group of related orders share some symptoms, even so a lots of people still use the term Asperger's. The condition is what doctors call a high functioning type of ASD. This means the symptoms are less severe than other kinds of autism spectrum disorders. The DSM-5 also includes a new diagnosis called Social Pragmatic Communication Disorder, which has some symptoms that overlap with Asperger's. Doctors use it to describe people who have trouble talking and writing, but have normal intelligence. Symptoms. They start early in life. If your mom and dad of a kid who or dad of a kid who has it you may notice that they can't make eye contact you may also find that your child seems awkward in social situations and doesn't know what to say or how to respond when someone talks to them 
they miss they may miss social cues that are obvious to other folks like body language or the expressions on people's faces for instance they may not realize that when somebody crosses their arms and scowls they're angry other signs is that your child may show few emotions they may not smile when they're happy or laugh at a joke or they may speak in a flat robotic kind of way if your child has the condition they may talk about themselves most of the time and zero in with a lot of intensity on a single subject like rocks or football stats and they might repeat themselves a lot especially on a topic that they're interested in they might also do the same movements over and over they may they also may like dislike change for instance they may eat the same food for breakfast every day or have trouble moving from one class to another during the day if you notice signs in your child see your pediatrician they can refer to your mental health expert who specializes in asd like one of these a psychologist a pediatric neurologist a developmental pediat pediatrician a psychiatrist the condition is often treated with a team approach this means you might see more than one doctor for your child's care the doctor will ask about your child's behavior including what symptoms do they have and when did you first notice them when did your child first learn to speak and how do they communicate are they focused on any subjects or activities do they have friends and how do they interact with others then they'll observe your child in different situations to see firsthand how they communicate and behave treatment every child is different so there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach your doctor might need to try a few therapies to find ones that work treatments can include social skills training in groups or one-on-one -on -one sessions therapists teach your child how to interact with others and express themselves in more appropriate ways social skills are often best learned by modeling after typical behavior speech language therapy this helps improve your kids communication skills for example they'll learn how to use a normal up and down pattern when they speak rather than a flat tone they'll also get lessons on how to keep up a two-way conversation and understand social cues like hand gestures and eye contact cognitive behavioral therapy it helps your child change their way of thinking so they can better control their emotions and repetitive behaviors they'll be able to get a handle on things like outbursts meltdowns and obsessions parent education and training you'll learn many of the same techniques your child is taught so you can work on social skills with them at home some families also see a counselor to help them deal with the challenges of living with someone with asperger's applied behavior analysis it is a technique that encourages positive social and communication skills in your child and discourages behavior you'd rather not see the therapist will use praise or other positive reinforcement to get results medicine there aren't any drugs currently approved by the fda that specifically treats asperger's or autism spectrum disorders some medications though can help with related symptoms like depression and anxiety the doctor may prescribe some of these a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors anti-psychotic anti drugs and stimulant medications with the right treatment your child can learn to control some of the social and communication challenges that they face they can do well in school and then go on to succeed in life all right so when the idea of autism came up to me and to my girlfriend when we first were thinking about it um, the lack of understanding and the knowledge on autism was kind of limited we were thinking asperger's because it like i said it is a high functioning level of autism on the spectrum i am fully capable of living on my own taking care of myself you know paying the bills buying groceries driving a car etc etc i've been doing that for many years um my issues are really to do with social aspects um i have a lot of odd things that occur like i'm not very good at recognizing emotions expressing emotions um i'm really bad at you know noticing social cues and recognizing what they are and what they mean and then displaying emotion 
and giving the appropriate emotional response when someone is like expressing their own emotions is something that's very difficult and that I often struggle with. Um, just today, as a matter of fact, I had a struggle with the ability to show emotional response to someone. They, She was talking about how something that I had done was hurtful and felt frustrating and such. And instead of, you know, I, I was listening to her and I understood what she said, but instead of giving the appropriate response and acknowledgement that was required that most people who are neurotypical would automatically know to do and learn through life, I automatically went into explaining my part of the situation instead of doing any kind of a response, whether it was an emotional response or acknowledgement. And I have always had a struggle with this and she continually gets upset and frustrated because I always fail to do that. I'm aware after that it is something that needs to be done and I get frustrated myself because of the fact that I realize that I need to do it, but I continually fail in the moment to actually act on that. And I'm really bad at being you know, authentic or emotionally empathetic when it comes to like even giving an apology. I do sound like in the reading that I, I was showing or telling everybody, I do often sound very monotone or robotic when I am speaking, especially if I'm feeling like pushed or stressed or any kind of level of anxiety because I realize that I've done something wrong or there's a situation that is stressful to me, I can get very monotone. And even, to be honest, when I'm doing my podcasts, it happens and I sometimes notice it and I try to change how I'm speaking and the tone and the level that I'm doing in the moment. But often it does tend to go unnoticed and I'm sure a lot of you who have listened to my podcasts in the past and are watching my videos that I've made in this one will probably agree that you will notice that a lot of times there seems to be a very monotone leveled speech when I'm talking. I sometimes notice it but more often than not I don't so a lot of my the, a lot of the things that I'm talking about and when I'm doing my recordings will sound very monotonous uh, and sometimes robotic. And I do occasionally notice that that's what's happening. So I try to change the inf like inflection in my voice and the level and the tone, like the higher, lower tone levels. Um, but it is difficult to catch. Another thing, like I'm, I'm a very literal person. I don't know. I'm, I'm actually quite poor when it comes to logic, like thinking logically. I tend to think very literal. And I, a lot of the times will give literal responses back to someone who's questioning me, or giving me details, instead of, you know, stopping and sp and thinking logically, and then verbalizing it in a logical manner. And people, especially my girlfriend, because she's obviously around me all day long, get frustrated because they're looking for a logical response or, or a logical thought to the situation. And I am not capable of doing that. I, it's, it is something that I definitely struggle with. And I am trying to learn, uh, through repetition and training, which is a slow process. I am trying, uh, learning or slowly learning to become more of a logical thinker and express myself more logically than literal. And I'm also trying to work on being more emotional when I'm communicating, which is extremely difficult. And I often forget or don't even know that I am doing it wrong. Another thing that I find is very, very important to me, and I've never really thought about it. I always thought this was an ADHD thing because you can have 
with ADHD routines that are important, but the routines more tend to be to remember something or remember items to, you know, to have a, an order so that you don't end up forgetting something, whether it's like your keys or your wallet or gloves or a coat or something on the, like if your stuff's all spread out, there's a good chance that you're going to forget one or two items while you're trying to rush out the door because your time management skills are so poor. Autism or autistic routine like that I do is not necessarily a memory thing or remember like I do have a bad time remembering things uh, I often get distracted or have such a poor ability to focus on what I'm doing in the moment that I forget often that there's something like there are a lot of times where I'm trying to get out the door and I'm trying to get ready to go to work that I will have my coat and I'll have my gloves, but I like forget my keys or I've forgotten my wallet in the kitchen in the place where everything is supposed to be located. And I have made a number of trips back and forth from the door back to where my keys are located or the wallet is located. And I'm wasting time because I'm in such a rush and my management, my, my organizational skills and my time management skills are so weak that it never fails. It seems nine out of ten times I'm rushing to get out the door. But it also, a lot of this is affected by autism because there are often things in my daily life and in a number of different ways. I don't remember necessarily all the different things that I do that have a routine. But there are many like tasks and chores and, and things that I do that have routines built in that feel very automatic. But until you think about it and you actually process it out in your mind, then you realize that, yeah, there's a lot of these things that are routine based. Like when I vacuum the house, like we have a two story house that we rent and there's a downstairs area that has uh that has to be done once a week and then our upstairs which can is done once or two times a week because we tend to be up there the most uh, together i have a i never realized this until recently that i actually have a a routine that i do when vacuuming that is always done the same way I always start in the kitchen, although sometimes I start, well, okay, nine out of 10 times I tend to start in the living room. And so I'll vacuum around the carpet or the rug, and then I will do the, like vacuum the rug. And I have a, like, it's not an easy rug to clean because it gets a lot of dog and cat hair on it. So there's a lot of vacuuming going back and forth. And then I move onwards and I go into each little specific area within the living room. And then I go into the, into the dining area and do the dining area. And then I do the kitchen and then the table in the kitchen. And then I go and I do the hallway and then I do the other hallway and then I do the bathroom and then I'm vacuuming the other rooms. And it's the same way. And with the downstairs, I always seem to vacuum the main hallway and then it's like the bathroom and the waiting room and then it's the studio and then I'll vacuum the stairs and then the last thing I do will be the entrance way with which has a a large rug that uh, that we have there. So it's it's this and it's always the same. And I never realize or I never realized exactly the whole point what it to what it why I was doing it. But then it occurred to me that the whole point was to make sure that it gets done properly. Because if, if I were doing it randomly, just kind of going all over the place, there's a lot of things that I would miss. Um, and there's a good chance that 30% or 40% of the room may not get done properly or be completely clean. So the routine was designed over you know, eventually imperfected in a way 
to ensure that everything got clean as best as possible. And there's there's other things like like making food. Um, I do tend to do it a certain way every time. Uh, it doesn't really matter what I'm making. Um, like walking the do the dog is a, has a specific uh, way of going. Like uh, of, on the leash, there's. Uh, there's a lot of different things that I could do or I could explain that has a routine. Um, now, the other thing that one of the bigger symptoms that I've that we recently discovered was the having the autistic meltdown and freezing and just shutting down. Um, if the situation got stressful or there was any sign of anxiety or where things weren't going right, or it, it, like I noticed that things were getting a little hectic or crazy, I often mentally would shut down. And signs of that occurring would be like repeating what I've said, um, being told, you know, you gotta, this is, that doesn't make sense, say it differently. And then I would repeat the same thing, or I would, like start pacing back and forth in the kitchen to the to the hallway. Uh, my voice would get louder. Um, if things were if like the audio or the like the the noise level like the her volume or my volume like sorry her volume uh, voice volume would increase. I would start to like almost kind of like raise my hands like as if I can't take it anymore or, or I'm sometimes I would be going towards my ears to like cover them especially if he was getting quite she was getting quite loud and then ultimately I would just shut down and I wouldn't be able to think I could barely respond logically or in any way and I was pretty much useless in the conversation and that would also make it very difficult to listen to her when she would ask me to leave or go away for a while to calm down and to regroup it would be very difficult for me to do that as well and so a lot of times she would have to like say three or four times to get out of the room or to go away before i would actually respond and i would you know there'd be signs of anger or signs of frustration in my tone and the way i speak and the funny thing is, is I don't even mean to do it. And I, like, I'm honestly not an angry person. I'm not a, I'm not mean. I'm not in any way bad. You know, my behaviors are not intentionally like that. But a lot of times it feels like I don't have a lot of control over it. In the past, a lot of it was due to complex trauma but lately there's i've been getting i've been having a really good grasp of of the trauma and we're really really finding that every time nearly every time that something is going on it's because of the autism and all the signs are there the the shutting down the pacing the the inability to think not being able to be logical always literal um not always being able to say what's on your mind you know improper words or use of or improper phrases uh the inability to understand what's being said and not being able to repeat it um uh, being easily frustrated and easily anxious when um put on the spot or being asked to like repeat something or or like role play which she does tend to do at times when she's upset and she's trying to get me to understand what is happening i have a difficult time like being willing to do it and it feels it feels difficult like it feels hard to do wasn't really sure what exactly that was in the moment um but it's it was one of those things that would was always there and the problem that was being is getting so complicated is the fact that i have adhd i've got cptsd along with the autism and 
there's a good chance that a learning disability or even a language uh, disorder is in, in play. I'm not exactly someone who, when I grew up, had friends. I did have a few. Um, there were two or three that I always, always would hang out with after school on a nearly regular basis, but we always did similar things. We were always playing hockey and football or baseball. We would, there would always be something happening. And if we weren't playing sports, we would be playing sports in video games. So there was always this common thread that we were always doing. And I never dated when I was in school. Like the idea of doing it was kind of there, but I never succeeded. And I eventually got to the point where I didn't really try to date anybody in school. Um, mostly because I knew that and I had no idea at the moment why it was, but I just knew that most of the people, especially the girls in school, didn't really like me. They, they, they found me odd or weird. And I always thought there was something going on with like being difficult or opinionated or being childish or, or hyperactive. The ADHD did definitely play a role, but the thing that was probably hiding because of the ADHD would be the autism and nobody really knew like that was it was still pretty recently you know not very widely researched and understood back then in the 80s and so of course naturally I went undiagnosed and nobody even had a clue that that was a possibility well I didn't know none, <coughs> none of my teachers knew and my parents didn't know so when I hit the age of 18, things changed. Uh, well, first off, school was done. Um, and then my friends, they kind of got off into their own lives. Um, the one of the, the two friends that I knew that I had were brothers. And the first one went off and got a job and was always gone. And then the younger one was hanging out with other people and he was had a he was starting to have a girlfriend and he was doing adult like things like working full time and and being with his girlfriend and and you know like things that normal typical adults in their early when they're 18 and their early 20s would do whereas I really didn't have the ability or the understanding of it I didn't have any of my social skills were pretty poor. My understanding and my etiquette and uh, and knowing what to do in situations with people were very poorly developed. And so I often drove people away because I didn't know how to behave properly. I didn't know how to make correct assumptions or, or you know, like know how to what to say, what to do, how to act. Uh, how to be social in group settings or at parties. I was an oddball. And if I had known or if anybody had known back in the day that it was autism and ADHD, like combined, there I probably could have gotten a lot of help and would have been able to have some training involved and some therapy to make this easier to handle. So it's just one of those things, you know, like you learn... Some, some people learn when it's too late and you just have to find ways to deal with it. It's just one of those things. And yeah, it eventually you figure it out. But you'll like I there's no way I can't just start over or change the way I learn. Like I learn, it's it's not an easy thing. It's actually nearly impossible to just suddenly change your behaviors, and act different. You have like I have forty three plus years of of the way I've lived and the and the things that I've done and the behaviors that I I have. I can't necessarily just change those without a lot of training and a lot of therapy and a lot of practice and adjusting and making changes it's it's a difficult thing to do i am 
looking for proper therapy and eventually I will, you know, get there and then we'll figure it out, right? Like we will get it and then we'll go from there. But it does cause a lot of frustration in relationship, like in my relationship and it's been very stressful and I get quite angry but it's never expressed like i never physically show it like you wouldn't necessarily know that i'm angry about the situation and the fact that i have autism and what it's doing to me and what it's doing to my girlfriend and our and our relationship you wouldn't necessarily see the expression that i that i want to use a lot of it is hidden internally so it's difficult to see it it's difficult to know what's happening there are times when eventually like i can do it like i can show my emotions better but a lot it is difficult to be honest a lot of the times just because of the way i've grown up and because of the autism i have a very difficult time with emotions and expressing them and understanding them from other people and then of course the inability or the poor ability to be logic logical in thinking and processing and understanding me things the way they work you soon learn that it, it looks looks weird or looks like i'm doesn't appear to be very intelligent or that i don't know what i'm doing or i don't know how to do things but the reality is is that i am it's just my thought process and the way I do things is so much different than a normal, a neurotypical person would. And most people wouldn't understand that because that their lack of understanding and knowledge when it comes to autism. I, I know I have a long road ahead, but I really want to face this head on and I want to do whatever I can to make it better. It's going to take a lot of work, but I don't really care. I just want to get some sort of help and some sort of uh, assistance when it comes to dealing with it and learn how to be better logical, a uh, better logically thoughtful person and emotionally developed and be better in social situations and improve my skills so that I can be better prepared for life, which, to be honest, I'm not all that prepared for in in a normal way i've been able to get by uh i li i have lived on my own for nearly eight years and i have been able to survive i haven't missed payments i haven't had any issues when it comes to rent or or paying my mortgage or making bill payments there it's just there are some things that i have a bad time with and have a, a poor control over and haven't had any up to 2019 i hadn't had any really good relationships and i have very few friends and these friends are very understanding and i'm quite blessed to have them but for the most part i don't get along with a lot of people and a lot of people don't want to have a lot to do with me because of my situation it sucks but that's just the way it is nothing you can really do about it you can tell people you can explain to them but a lot of people are more likely going to walk away and not want anything to do with it rather than deal with the problems and be patient and understanding and not really care it doesn't quite work that way unfortunately and i'm sure a lot of you know that just from your own experiences too bad really uh anyways that's today's episode um i hope this is um good for you and, and it's helpful and shows you a bit more about autism and what to expect um i am on twitter you can look me up uh, my username is adhd and cptsd uh, my website is www.livingwithadhdandcptsd.ca. You can donate to me and help support my podcast and my YouTube. I am at kofi.com, C-K-O-F-I.com. And 
buymeacoffee.com and there's also subscriptions at Anchor, which is my podcast um, platform that develops my podcast and gets them out all over to, on the airwaves. If you'd like to give me a chat, you know, you want to talk, um, you can reach me on Twitter. Um, I am very open to talking and I'd love to get to know people. Uh, give me a shout. Let people know about this pot, this this show on YouTube and my podcast. Um, check them out. I've got plenty of podcast episodes. There's over 40 so far since I've been on the air, and I really think they I really think they'd be very helpful and educational for everybody. All right, guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this, and I will talk to you again later. Bye.